Hopefully it didn't derp out for you. I just, my, my, my slobs just went, uh, what? And it stopped. A woo, indeed, Dark Wolf. Here, I'll also a woo. <laughs> Alright, well, hey, let's get into it, right? We are going to be exploring this playtest content. Um, where's, okay. My minis are down there. Everything is, everything is good and set. Let's get going. Yeah. <laughs> it is a good emote, isn't it? Uh, J-Man did a good job with that. This first playtest document focuses on the racial rules, class options, and backgrounds, allowing you to build a canine character. Also included... Oh. Could we get one of the monster menageries and our dragon has dragged home? Da I cannot resist the mints. Well, certainly. So, I will, uh... I will, uh... Yes, one crit wonder. It, it is that Maddie fellow. Tis it is. Let's grab these here. Yeah. Uh, so trust a flump. A donation is a male German accent. Um, bits are a. Uh, bits are a. Oh, you noticed this again, trust a flump. Thank you. Oh, sh uh, shoot, you should have, uh, uh, I, I don't know if it gave you the option for text-to-speech, but, um, uh, I, one is a male German voice, another is a female Welsh accent, and another one is a female Australian accent. But thank you very much. All right, so here's your monster menagerie. Trust a flump. Whoever you are. Mysterious stranger. Uh, so at this stage, we're interested in demonstrating the design philosophy of the rules and testing for clarity and ease of understanding. We are also interested in balance, but this is a lesser con concern for the initial round of feedback. The design philosophy of the rules is to take a modular approach that enables every dog to be a really unique creation. There are over 20 canine feet options that can be taken in pairs. Uh, over 230 possible combinations. Uh, and each class has three further options to flavor and shape a canine character. The theme and flavor of the abilities is centered on support and bonding. Most of the class options in particular lean into providing support for your allies and party companions. This was the style of play we felt appropriate for a dog character. The final version of this document will include lore, fiction, DM, and player guidance and illustrations, along with sample characters. Derek uh, says, whoever's there for you at your worst moments is a true friend. So, my enemies? <laughs> yeah, your enemies are always around when things are bad, huh? Hey, Rhodium. <laughs> uh, so trust a flump. Here is what is inside your monster menagerie box. Uh, we will start out. Let's go here real quick. Oh, uh, flump. Uh, Derek ended up get, uh, getting an Aaron Yeez, uh, out of his pull yesterday. Good stuff. Uh, I remember fighting those in that Sunday session that you invited me to play in. Uh, so thank you for that. All right, so first up, uh, Derek was talking about some bread and butter figures. Uh, we popped a Skelly. Oh, dude, uh, Flumph, we had a Rakshasa pulled uh, the other day. Next up is a Gif Yankee Warrior. A Gif Yankee Warrior. And now, trust a Flumph, you get two options. 
Um, because you have a rare, and you have a uh, you have a rare and a large uncommon. Uh, so, if you are ready, trust a flump, you can take either a gelatinous cube. And by the way, it does open up, so you can put a figure inside of it if you do uh, consume someone. Or, if you don't want the gelatinous cube, you can instead take an invisible Strahd Von Zarovich. A cube or an invisible Strahd Von Zarovich. Uh, one crit, there is, uh, on the open marketplace, there is a cube also. Take the money. <laughs> well, you know, Evelon, uh, if he has a paint set, uh, it would be, it would probably be easier to actually apply paint to this if he wanted a custom Strahd. Yeah, uh, trust a flump. Let me know wh which one you want. Because uh, I'll tell you what, we'll continue narrating and I'll open up your other box, okay? <clears throat> All right, the rules presented here allow you to play human kinds or elven kinds or dwarven kinds etc best friend the noble and companionable dog there are racial rules class options feats and other rules to allow for the addition of a dog character hey hey x cat i hope you had a good art stream thank you um there are racial rules, class options, feats, and other rules to allow for the addition of a dog character to a party, or even a whole party of canine adventurers. So I guess you got to ask yourself, you know, do you uh, do you want to have a party of maybe four, and then someone can play the animal companion, right? <laughs> uh, there is a unique delight in providing rules to play as a dog character. There are few, if any, animals that are as closely bonded to humans as, as doggos, and they have been our companions and partners for a long period of history. So it feels somehow right that they get their time at the table with other adventurers. The style of play described for dogs assumes that role of companion and support, with dogs being both self-sufficient and, through their class choices, a very supportive part of the adventuring party. Note that these rules are not intended to represent anthropomorphic dogs, no bipedal opposable thumb-owning dogs here. Instead, they assume some manner of event that has imbued a dog with intellectual awakening and self-awareness without altering their physical makeup. Hey, x -Cat. Okay, oh, the ad finish. That's true when, when that occurs here. All right, so, uh, trust a flump. Uh, this is what you are, uh, this is what we've popped open. We're starting off with a, uh, a Varguil, right? Like a little, a little flying head. And actually, I don't know if it's a mispack or whatnot. There's actually two of them here. Bleh. If you don't want those, I mean, those are common pieces. We continue to scroll down. And now you have a... A human sun soul monk. A human sun soul monk. Lastly, but not leastly, uh, let's see. I cannot escape. I cannot escape that Sunday game, right? Because, wouldn't you know it, uh, there is a large, uncommon pit fiend. A pit fiend. Wow. 
Rawr. I cannot not pick the Pit Fiend. Fair enough. I will set the Pit Fiend for sure aside for you in your box uh, to send out with your with your Yeti also. Huh, fire, fire and ice, right? And so, we replace... There we go. Uh, pit fiends are amazing, especially if you remember their their fear aura. <laughs> hey, look, I've done it too, where I I forget an aura or some other constant effect that a monster's had, and you're like, I thought this I, this what's not going right in this fight? There should be something. What is it? Oh, got it, got it. <laughs> yep, yep, that happens. A fiendish friend, or a friendish fiend. Yeah, pit fiends get lonely too. Exactly, Rhodium. If you're gonna have to go with the cube on the other box, though, just don't know when I'll be uh, when I'll be strutting. Sure. All right. So I will put the pit fiend and the gelatinous cube in uh, in your box. You're very welcome. Uh, you are. You're very welcome. Daily. That is. Oh my gosh. Well, daily welcome. Uh, hopefully, you caught the the cool pulls that Trust Flump got from uh, his Monster Menagerie and his in uh, the brand new set that came out, Dragon Heist. Uh, he got a gelatinous cube and a pit fiend. But thank you very much for that re-up on your subscription, Daily. Alright, so, the Strahd, the Strahd's going to go in the loose minis. Also, Daily, um, and for any of you who have just joined us, we're starting our examination of the Dungeons and Doggos uh, unofficial supplement. Uh, this was a Kickstarter project. Um, it is... Or do I have it? Here we go. It has miniatures, and by the way, I, I might be doing some kind of a I might be doing some kind of a thing with a pack of these minis once I get them in. So stay tuned on that. Yeah, cube life. You never forget your first cube. <laughs> All right, so as such, or these are not anthropomorphic dogs. This is, you will play a dog, an awakened dog, in 5th edition D&D. Yeah, gelatinous companion cube. It's okay, I don't blame you. <laughs> uh, there are a few assumptions made to ensure that the character you create can interact with the wider world. Communication and tool use are both discussed with these rules and options for new equipment ideas are, and... Uh, options for new equipment ideas are also suggested. The most important thing is that your dog characters get to feel sufficiently doggy in the way the rules support role-playing. Whether as a single canine member of a traditional adventuring group or as a part of a complete pack of hounds to make their mark on the world, heh, have, uh, have fun, sniff a few trees, and always, always enjoy a good belly rub now and again. When was the last time, my friends that you had an adventurer that had a good belly rub, huh? Come on, be honest. Any of you? Well, now you can. You almost got in on this Kickstarter, says Daily. You almost TPK'd your most recent party with a, with a cube. Oh, my. 
Derek says, I was killed in your game with one, and that was a Black Dragonborn Paladin, so I dissolved slow. Oh my. <laughs> Dog. The sound of the horns warned of the raider's approach. Even before Alland had begun to roll out of her tent and draw her knives, Oak was already moving, slow to the ground with his hackles raised and barely and a barely audible growl in his throat. He was an old dog now, gray at the muzzle and deaf in one ear. They'd grown together, dark-skinned girl and snow-white dog, never apart. Oak had been as true and strong as the tree whose name he bore. Comforting her throughout loss, joyous in play, unfailing in trust, and deadly in defense of his family. If tonight, protecting the children of the village below, if tonight was the night they fell, it would be as they had lived, together as one human and dog, a bond not even death would break. The warmth of a roaring fire, the breathless joy of the hunt, the trackless wastes of a long journey, provided they are close to the ones they call family and pack, dogs, uh, dogs can call anywhere home. For much of history, dogs have been stalwart companions, faithful guardians and beloved kin to their two-legged allies. Loyalty, faith, devotion, and selflessness has guided the dog through the ages. Endlessly variable, constantly adaptable, dogs have been shaped by their entwined history with other races until little trace of their wild ancestry remains. Now, a breed of dog seems to exist for every possible niche within society for, and for every task. From great shaggy hunting dogs to the tiniest of lap dogs, the variety of the canine form seems without bounds. Generally, dogs tend to live between 10 and 15 years and reach adulthood around 18 months old. Whilst it is, uh, it is usual for dogs to live with families or individuals of other races, dogs will also form their own groups naturally for strength and companionship. A wide variety or a wide array of natural colors and coats occur, and thus individual dogs are easily identified by other races visually, even as they rely more on their sense of smell for such things themselves. Loyal and true. Doggos are naturally loyal to those they see as a pack. This trait carries through to intelligent dogs from their wilder kin. Those who claim a dog is a friend has a true and unshakable companion for life. Affable and upbeat, dogs live for the now and enjoy experiencing curiosity and adventure. They have few emotional filters and can switch from effervescent joy to melancholy in a moment. However, they shed black moods very easily and seem incapable of holding a grudge or harboring ill feeling. Dogs are easily moved to help others and relieve suffering and will be generous with their affection and time. Oh, all right. Welcome back, X Cat. We're now X Cat. We are talking about doggos, but I think they can they can exist at the same time. Dogs have the capacity to make their homes almost anywhere that they choose, but the most common places they are found is within the settlements of other races, acting in a wide range of ro of roles. Wild dogs do also thrive under different circumstances in the more temperate areas of the world. Intelligent dogs tend to remain closely linked. Oh, pardon me. Uh, with either their adopted society or the wild area they knew as pups. However, a dog's sense of home is usually defined by their company rather than a place, and dogs are comfortable traveling widely as long as they have con the consistency of friendship. Derek says, Remember when you die, your house cat will use your body as a food source. See, that's practical. <laughs> dogs gifted with unusual intelligence seek adventure for many reasons it is common that answers to the questions about why they are so different to their kind are a driving force but equally the desire to make a difference will motivate many dogs their instinctive urge to support and assist coupled with the ability to reflect on the world in deep terms, can be more than enough to lead a dog from the warmth of a home and into the wider world. I am a cat person too, Derek. 
Xcat says, don't be one of those people who think cats are evil. Those people are stupid people who don't know cats very well. <laughs> Why? Is that because uh, is that because we don't think cats are evil, but they actually just are evil? <laughs> I'm getting kind of scruffy again. I'm going to have to trim up the old mustache. It's tickling my nose. All right. So here uh, here we are going to be getting into uh, a canine as a race, as a, uh, as a PC race. Ability score increase. Your charisma increases by one. Age, dogs reach maturity around 18 months and usually live between 10 and 15 years. Alignment. Dogs tend towards good alignments due to their natural urge to be helpful, but there are exceptions to this. Size. Dogs vary in size based on breed. See below. Speed. A base walking speed of 30 feet. Dogs can understand common in two other chosen languages. Note that dogs do not necessarily use speech. Whilst they can understand their chosen languages, the specifics of how they communicate are left to the players. Some possibilities include having the full ability of speech, being uncannily effective at conveying meaning through gesture and sounds. I think she's saying the kids are, are down in the well. Or having another character who can understand and interpret for the dog. Regardless of how the dog expresses itself, it is assumed that it is communicating with its allies with sufficient fluency as to avoid any penalties in combat situations. Uh, Xcat, uh, for part one and two, I'm going to be going over this, uh, this Kickstarter info uh, for, uh, for doggos. And part three, uh, we'll, we'll see when we cross that bridge um, you know, how much energy I have, how long the review is going to take, etc. But hey, it's the beginning of a week, and we, we got uh, several more days until Saturday. Senses. Dogs have dark vision. They have advantage on checks that rely upon scent or hearing, and disadvantage on checks depending upon color recognition. Aha. So, they, they covered the first thought that came to mind. Because, well, have you ever played a character that's been colorblind? Even if you yourself, because you know what? Some of you out there, and you don't have to say if you don't want to. Some of you out there may be, as a player character, colorblind. But do you ever just presume that your character sees colors normally? Well, here, this is an interesting roleplay challenge. Because you are playing a colorblind character. Uh, a, a colorblind character. Not that you can't see. You can see detail and such. But when it comes to things like color recognition, your character just won't be able to do it. Derek says, I've played a character with no sense of touch. So, like, a leper... Like the disease, uh, the disease made all of their all their nerve endings numb or something. How did that work, Derek? Yeah, was it a ghost? Uh, they could touch; they just couldn't tell you how much pressure, what the texture was. Interesting. Best friend, dogs may cast the charm person first level spell once per short rest. Now, I have no problem with dogs, though I am I'm a cat person. I own two cats. I will just presume that dogs have this in, as an innate ability in real life as well. Tended to be two modes: break something by squeezing it too hard. Or let something slip through trying to be too gentle. Welcome back, Killer Sense of Humor. Wh 
Worse than the bark. You have a natural bite attack. You are proficient with this attack, and it counts as an unarmed attack. This attack does 1d4 plus strength modifier damage. This increases to 1d6 plus strength at level 5, and 1d8 plus strength at level 10. Many breeds, many forms. Dogs have such variety of shapes and breeds that they are highly diverse. Choose one of the following subcategories to reflect your chosen breeding and select one canine feat from the list below. Oh, it was a medicine check to, to, to determine if you were able to grip something. Interesting, Derek. Or, or, or that was for the, the injuries. Oh, okay, it's for the injuries. Got it. All right, if you want to play a large doggo, so a woofer, Right, you have you have puppers, doggos, and woofers. Borfers, I I might I might accept as well. Large dogs are the strongest and most physically imposing animals in the canine family. Mastiffs, Saint Bernards, and um, Alsatians. I, I haven't heard of that breed. Uh, Alsatians all fall into this size of breed. Uh, your strength score increases by two. Powerful bite. When you use your bite attack, you roll two dice for damage and choose the higher result. For a critical hit, roll three dice and choose the best two results. You want to be a medium doggo? Well, medium dogs may be the most common sized dogs and tend to be known for energy and hail sturdiness. This includes spaniels, bulldogs, and many crossbreeds. Your constitution score increases by two. Boundless persistence. Once per long rest, when you are reduced to zero hit points, you may immediately roll a hit dice to heal that many hit points. What, uh, since this is playtest information, you know, if we're making notes and or if we're making these ourselves, does this make sense? Or would you say, oh, let's give him that orc ability. That's like a focus sash in Pokemon. I don't know if all of you are, are getting the reference. Would it be easier to take a concept like what the half-orcs have and substitute it instead of creating uh, its own sort of verbiage? These are things to think about. I I'm not challenging you to come up with an answer, um, but, you know, consider it. The the uh, these are rhetorical. You can answer if you want, though. It's a variation of Strength of the Grave. What? Oh, so what is Strength of the Grave from, X-Cat? Is that a spell, or is that off of a race or something? Or you can play a little pupper. Tiny of body, but giant of heart. Small dogs are known for nimble movement and fearless attitude. This category includes Chihuahuas, Terriers and Maltese. A shadow sorcerer. Okay. All right. Uh, is I'm not familiar with all the splat. I I miss that. So if it's modeled after something, hey, I appreciate you bringing it up, X Cat. Uh, your dexterity score increases by two if you're a pupper. Slippery. If your attack is a critical hit. You may dodge as a free action after resolving the attack. Hmm. If your attack is a critical hit, you may dodge as a free action after... That seems, I don't know, kind of awkward or clunky to me. Is that based on something? Do you all know? Otherwise, I would almost want to give them something like um, Halfling Nimbleness instead. Hey, bad luck. Good to see you back. That pupper ability is terrible. I... It, it's terrible. <laughs> um, I, yeah, I, I don't like it, right? It's only a 5% chance uh, to get a free dodge. And you're probably going to be playing, um, you know, maybe a rogue or some other sort of dexterous class anyway, right? 
You're done. Oh no, bad luck. No, come back. I'm sorry, I didn't mean it. I did. I'm owning that pun, but I didn't mean it. Zuller Pie, welcome. It's definitely not a typical thing in 5e. Seems like a 4e thing, especially with the free action term. Um, yeah. I, so I would almost just give them, what, halfling nimbleness, right? Just, you know, call it, uh, you know, like... Pupper nimbleness. <laughs> I don't know what you'd want to call it. But I, I think we could swap that out, right? So we have our base, we have our base uh, dog, right? And then we have our three sub races of large dog, medium dog, and small dog. Ah, thank you, X Cat. Mucho apreciado. Dogs are an almost infinitely varied species, and as such, are represented by the size-based subcategories, and either following canine feats. I, I guess that should be in uh, any, any or. Anyway, the language can be fixed, but I, I want to look at the mechanics. These are intended to help reflect a certain breeding or classic role that dogs are renowned for. You may choose two of these feats at level one and may use this list in addition to feats in the player's handbook and other sources at any time your character may opt to choose a feat. All right, so you get base doggo. You then choose if you are, um, if you're a borfer, a doggo, or a pupper, right? Large, medium, or small breed. And then you get to choose two of these feats as a level one character. Giant puppy, big puppy, and little puppy. Oh, <laughs> Fluffy. Yeah, see, so Fluffy, Fluffy's a resident dog person. Or dog sheep. Or sheepdog? Well, I guess it would be a... I guess the sheepdog would be your pupper. Bad luck, I need this in my life. Alright, so frenzied fighting. You are adept at the frantic combination of barking, scratching, biting, and general chouse that typifies some dogs when they're enraged. You may cast Thunder Wave as a first level spell once per long rest. The damage from this is not considered magical. Ah, yes, of, of course our Wu is a resident dog person. Uh, bad luck, Binks. The playtest, uh, this 1.0 playtest is on our Discord. I wanted to share it uh, for what we're doing tonight to get input so that we can go back to this Kickstarter and we can give them some really solid uh, information, right? Because they want it playtested, they want it stress-tested. Um, I, I supported several kits of this, by the way, because, look, it comes with, it comes with miniatures. So you can play... Um, you can play Montague the Cocker Spaniel Bard, or Tedric the Chihuahua Rogue, or Nightingale the Pomeranian Monk, etc. Um, so here's uh, here's like the different mini sets, okay? Uh, so I have several of these sets coming in, and I'll probably be doing some sort of a special thing uh, when I actually receive the physical minis here in the channel. By the way, dogs are not colorblind. They have receptors for blue and yellow, so have a limited sense of color compared to humans who have red, green, and blue. Fluffy, I actually have a golden doodle, but I have a friend with a sheepdog, and they look kind of similar. Well, Fluffy, if you practice, if you practice sketching mixed breeds, do uh, mixed breed dogs. You can someday then have the pleasure of having someone reviewing your work and choosing you for your talent and saying, yes, that labradoodle doodler will do. Let's continue. <laughs> First cast. Hey, welcome. Thank you for joining. 
Yeah, so X-Cat, it, it didn't say that you're completely colorblind, just that you would get disadvantage on uh, on sight-based perception checks that involve color. Dog druids obviously turn into humans. Do doggo druid get humanoid shape? Uh, well, I don't know. We'll, we'll look below, X-Cat. Uh, let's continue looking at the feats that you can take. Uh, you get two at first level, and then you can pick up other ones when you'd pick up a feat otherwise. Uh, comforting companion. You are a soothing presence. When a creature you choose takes a short rest within 30 feet of you, as long as you are present for the entire rest, it regains hit points equal to your charisma modifier. Oh, gotcha, X-Cat. The eyes have it. You are just the cutest. You have advantage on any social ability checks based on being adorable. Uh, you could be a digger. You just have to dig. You have advantage on ability checks for digging. In combat, if you are in an environment which can be dug by your claws, you may take an action to go prone and gain half cover. Assistance Dog. You are gifted at guiding others. You can nominate a creature within five feet of you as an action. Whilst in this range, it benefits from your keen senses and has the advantages of your dark vision and senses as if it possessed the traits itself. Uh, so that would be, I guess, kind of like a pointer, like a hunting dog. Locking Jaws. You have a strong and powerful mouth and neck. When you, I, I can't, uh, imagining a small breed like this is fun. When you succeed in hitting a creature, you may declare it is grappled instead of rolling damage. You may not make an, other attacks whilst grappling in this way. Incessant barking. You have a bark that is hard to ignore, driving foes to distraction. You may cast the cantrip Vicious Mockery three times per long rest. Hunting ground. You are a nat you are a natural at seeking the quarry of your allies. If an ally hits a creature you are also attacking, you gain advantage on your next attack. First cast. Yes, so how how the makers of this content are setting it up is you are playing as uh, as a dog. You're you have an awakened intelligence, but you are a quadrupedal dog. Ah, there you go, first cast. Though, if you have uh, questions along the way, then uh, please do ask. Uh, the concept here at level one is you get uh, basic dog stuff. Then you can choose a sub race of what size your dog is, and then you can take two two of these special dog feats at first level, and other feats when you would normally be able to. Uh, Fluffy says that uh, that feat does literally nothing. Is that for the uh, is that for the assistance dog? Uh, if so, I, I guess... I could see it as a way, if people are really concerned about metagaming, uh, that instead of just saying, you know, oh, so we have a drow in the party, and just tell us what the drow sees, because the drow's going to tell us everything it sees, that would be a way to, I guess, mitigate some of the quasi-metagaming filtering all information through the one character who can see or perceive. Oh, Jaws. You have a strong powerful when you succeed at hitting. Uh, so what, I don't know, what, what could we do to... Uh... Well, Assistance Dog plus Warlock, Devil Sight. Hey, yeah, you could, uh, you can make a warlock dog. So, what I'm thinking, X-Cat, because we're playing as dogs who don't have arms and, and hands and opposable thumbs, 
that that is a way for you to be able to grapple at all as a dog. Because it's not just the mechanics of 5th edition what a grapple does, but you have to think that this this content says that you are a dog. And aside from, you know, being able to, to grip with your, your neck and your mouth, you can't really grapple with your arms or put people into a leg lock. Well, it'll be contested to break out of the grapple, Dark Wolf. It's just saying if you rolled a hit and you would hit normally, uh, instead of dealing damage, you can just try and grapple your, your uh, character. You should be able to scratch and kick with your legs. All right. Hey, we can consider this. We're, we we got to stress test this. Let, let's, you know, consider, let's consider options. All right. You can be a hunting hound. You are a natural at seeking the quarry of your allies. If an ally hits a creature, you are also attacking. You gain advantage on your next attack. Well, it says you can declare it is grappled. Uh, you can, but I mean, there. Uh, then it, maybe we could make it clear that it, it initiates a grapple, but I would presume someone could try and and shake out of that grapple. Uh, killer, it is the developers of the miniatures who are trying to get some supplement, some rule supplements, to go along with fifth edition. So I think that okay, you have to grapple the creature, not roll to grapple. Yeah. So I guess it'll give you an it'll give you an initial freebie grapple, but they could break out afterwards. Unlocking jaws says daily. I would say it makes no sense that the initial successful attack would not do damage, as the then add grapple and continuous damage equal to your strength dex modifier each round. Is there a ramming attack? Bovier's would herd by ramming cattle. Just curious. Uh, we'll see if there is Zuler Pie. We haven't reached the end yet. Or when you have your teeth dug in, have to thrash attack. Ramming attacks are in the sheep supplement. <laughs> this is so silly. It should be cats, not dogs. It, it is supposed to be a, a lighthearted take on adventuring by playing as a, a conscious dog. As an awakened dog. So, a uh, hunting hound, you are natural at seeking the quarry of your allies. If an ally hits a creature you are also attacking, you gain advantage on your next attack. You can be a faithful friend. You are able to aid those around you just by your presence. Once per short rest, as your, as your reaction... Um... Once per short rest. Oh, okay, got it, got it, got it. So in between sh short rests, as a reaction, you can grant one instance of the luck feat to a creature within 30 feet of you. And that's probably what? That you can see? Or uh, that can see and hear you? Because you probably have to, you know, like, whimper, bark, you know, rawr, rawr, rawr. Also, clarifying the hunting hound feat would be good because creature you are attacking could mean the last thing you attacked or anything in your attack range. Yes. Let, hey, I'm I'm all for nitpicking over this. Um, you know they they wanted upfront. Uh, they they want some upfront. Uh, uh, upfront advice. We're not we're not being savages to them. Uh, we because we we care about this. We want it to be fun. We want it to. To be something that maybe we could play at our own tabletops and not have to worry, oh, this is tremendously under or overpowered or it's awkwardly worded. GTR Frost, welcome. Run, follow me if you want to live. <laughs> uh, dogged Persistence. 
You possess boundless energy and determination. You can give yourself resistance to any instance of damage as a reaction once per short rest. So I guess that's the that's the scrappy dog that you know will run into a burning house to go fetch a kid and come out relatively unharmed. So that's like the fire resistance. It's um I don't know, the dog who trudges through the arctic tundra in order to get home after being left at the bus stop accidentally. And it's kind of a representation of cold resistance and things like that. Bloodhound. You are a master of tracking. You have plus five to your passive perception and may use this bonus on rolls related to tracking a target using scent. at their heels. You are skilled in dogging your opponents no matter what. When a target provokes an attack of opportunity from you, if you hit, then you may also move up to 15 feet to remain in melee with your foe. Now, some of these, I think we can nitpick the wording and have it be explained better. Uh, I get the core concept. I think that something like this could be uh, written in a more mechanically consistent fashion. Uh, because instead of remaining in melee, it would be, you know, uh, adjacent. Or, you know, within reach. Guard Dog, you are gifted at reacting to attacks on your companions. If an ally is hit by an... By an attack, it, it says at attack, by an attack within five feet of you, you may use your reaction to make an attack against the attacker. It doesn't, though I do think that stuff like that should be included to get people to think or to shake things up. Um, you know what? Because you might get a DM who says, you know what? I want to be different. I've never really had my monsters dance on the battlefield. Thick coat. Your thick and glossy fur is a natural defense. You have plus one AC. There you go. Kettle dog. You are a natural at hurting your quarry. When you hit a creature with an attack of opportunity... You may place that creature on any unoccupied adjacent space before it resolves the rest of its movement. So I guess that's that kind of bonking uh, that, that you are looking for up above. Xcat says, if you want to force people to dance, take the Groovatron from Ratchet and Clank and convert it to a spell. Well, there is that six level uh, Auto Luke's Irresistible Dance. That is an illusion. Old dog, new tricks. Choose two skills and gain proficiency in both. Sprinter. You are built for bursts of impressive speed. Increase your base move by 10 feet. If you use your bonus action to dash, you can ignore the first attack of opportunity you would provoke. Uh, I don't know if ignore would be the best. Maybe it has disadvantage instead. Because, um, I mean, just increasing your base move by 10 feet to have a base of 40 is pretty good. And considering you're probably, in most instances, only going to... Uh, and uh, this is getting back to how many times does this happen. Um, I mean, if you just ignore your first attack, that'll be, this is anecdotal, that'll be whatever, 90% of any attack of opportunities you'll just ignore. Uh, I'd feel more comfortable at least giving it disadvantage. A blacksmith dog or a dog with proficiency with a bow. Imagine the visual. <laughs> Uh, 
Upright and alert. You can never be surprised. If your party is surprised, you will act normally in initiative order. Uh, and that's because, it, remember, in 5th edition, there's not a surprise round. Uh, surprise is a condition. So you would roll into initiative, and it just checks for who has that condition on them. It's not called a surprise round officially. Uh, shake it off. Once per long rest, you may take advantage on any saving throw to end a negative effect currently affecting you. That can be worded better. I get what it's going for. It can be worded in a manner that's more consistent with other spells or abilities. Catch and fetch. You are skilled at snatching things from the air and retrieving them. You can use the deflect missiles ability as if you were a second level monk once per short rest. I kind of like that. I kind of like that. Snow dog. You are naturally adapted to cold weather. You have resistance to cold damage. Retriever. You are a natural in seeking and re uh, you are a natural that should be probably at seeking and returning desired items. You gain a plus five bonus to perception skill checks when searching an area for a specified object. You do not need to have encountered your quarry, just know what it is. I think that either needs rewording or it needs to be. Hmm. The plus, I guess a static plus five is okay, but I think giving advantage, because statistically advantage is plus five. Um, I, I get the theme of Retriever, I just don't agree with how it's worded. Retriever should be smell-based. Well, uh, maybe, uh, though... I would imagine that, uh, like, hunting dogs um, are, can also identify, uh, like, a, a duck corpse in a swamp. And not just by smell, but by look, uh, by sight. And be able to fetch the duck to bring it back to the hunter. Well, uh, first cast, maybe. If you think mechanically they should, we could note that they should be mutually exclusive. Though the blurb said uh, that these exist to be able to really heavily customize your dog. Right? So if you have a golden retriever, it could be the big, fluffy, lovable, you know, family pet. Or you could actually have trained it to be a hunting dog to retrieve things for you. And so it's actually like big and tough and not really, it doesn't have to be mean, but it's really good at doing that job. I don't know if any of them are really powerful if you double them up. And that's fine. We're not trying to make a broken character at level one. Well, normal 5e, these types of things you mentioned with advantage to stop the stacking of these modifiers. Yeah. Yeah. Zuller Pie says, FYI, the books by Peter Abrahams feature a human detective and dog pair told by the dog, not anthropomorphic. A dog PC and a human owner NPC would be like that. It could be fun. I agree, Zuller Pie. I think it could be a lot of fun. It's plus 10, but it's also very specified. So that means you would have to be searching, you'd have to be familiar with the object and, and perceiving just by smell. 
if such a thing were even possible for whatever it is you're looking for. So, yes, there are circumstances where that character could get a plus 10 to perception. But then again, if you took a Retriever Bloodhound, you have been built to do this exact thing. Class options. Yeah, there you go, Trista Flump. Agreed first cast. 5e is designed around a system of bounded accuracies. You can do flat bonuses, but they're invariably incredibly powerful. Uh, either they're going to be too powerful, or they're just not really going to scale and be relevant. But I, I do agree, Trista Flump. Each class has several optional feats that may be taken with an existing class path replacing or enhancing the original class abilities. These abilities may be chosen whenever a canine character may choose a feat. Some feats have a prerequisite feat and act as a class progression alongside the chosen class path. I think I understand what that's saying. These abilities may be chosen whenever a canine character may choose a feat. Okay, and so each class has several optional feats that may be taken with an existing class path. Replacing or enhancing the original class abilities. Okay, so that's that's really leaving something, I guess, open for interpretation, right? Let's look at Barbarian. Um, you get Rage at level 1. I... You wouldn't want to replace Rage, I presume, with Savage Howl, because you have to be raging. So, I guess what that could mean, and, and really, the wording's kind of awkward, or uh, could allow for some unintended uh, comboing. Uh, for example, we get two doggy feats at level one. Maybe, maybe one of those feats could be a class feat as well. And so we'll be a normal bar, a, a level one barbarian per the player's handbook, and we'll be whatever a, a large dog. But uh, instead of the two dog feats, the generic ones, uh, we can accent our rage with savage howl. Your rages are accompanied by feral howls that inflame the blood of your allies and drive them forward, an echo of ancient hunting packs. Whilst raging, when you hit with at least one attack each round, you may nominate one ally within 30 feet of you. That ally receives a 1d6 bonus to its, its next damage roll. I feel that that should scale. Um, so I think I'm understanding what their intentions are here. Therefore, it might not be rules as written because it's not written the best, but I think rules as intended, we can use that as a reflection of what we're seeing. It, it I get that impression, Dark Wolf, but that's, uh, even if that's the case, I, I would like to think I made a decent argument that you could replace the two normal dog ones with these these uh, class accenting ones specifically. But I don't know. Fluffy Sheep says, it's like when uh, nerdarchy guys talk about his character eyes. You can already kind of break the game in terms of perception, specifically with just the PHB. Yes, you can. But perception's a really specific thing to... So if you make your character just do that, why not always just win that? Hey, yeah, own it, right? That's the a, that's a one thing you're good at. Should it be damage roll or more like inspire as for to hit? Or just say they get one more damage die. Ooh, pardon me.
Well, no, because it because that would be that would be mechanically like a free crit every round if they get. Uh, well, I guess that being said, they receive a one d six bonus to the, its next damage roll. Uh, that you're getting a I I guess a more than a critical on a dagger, and you're getting a critical hit with a short sword. I don't know. I don't know. Alpha of the pack, your howling fury establishes you as master of the hunt. Whilst raging, your allies have advantage against a single target within 30 feet of you that you nominate. <clears throat> you may change targets as a bonus action. First cast, oh, the plus 1d6 can crit. So then I so on a critical hit then the bonus damage would be plus 2d6. If I'm understanding what you're saying correctly. Uh, feral cooperation requires Savage Howl. Whilst you're raging, if your first attack hits a target, an ally within 15 feet may use a reaction to make a half move. Alright, so we're, we're coming into verbiage and vocabulary. May make a half move and take an immediate bonus attack against the same target. This move does not provoke attacks of opportunity. Dustin Stout, welcome. Just lurking around, uh, showing love to the small streamers. We are indeed, Dustin. Uh, thank you very much for lurking as we're exploring uh, Dungeons and Doggies here. Um, I very much appreciate you coming by and saying hi. If you enjoy dogs or you enjoy some RP, stick around. Or if you want to continue spreading love to small streamers, there's plenty more of us out there that could, that could use your, your encouragement and support. I think Feral Cooperation ends in one of two ways. It's forgotten, or the Barbarian player keeps telling other people to use it. Hey, Shlomo, good to see you. Is it really for playing a dog? <laughs> oh, and of course you'd use that emote. Ah, oh, it's so cute. I love it, Shlomo. Uh, Zuller Pie, it, it's been a day. Um, I, I mowed my lawn, and I was doing some other... I was wrestling with... Uh, I was wrestling a bit with a fence that was, uh, it, it needs some wrestled with. And so I was doing that. So I, I'm a little worn, although I think I can, I'm, I'm powering through at least this first part. I will be getting up to take a break here. Uh, probably, well, let's see. I don't know. Let's, let's get through Bard and Cleric and then we'll stop at Druid, take a 10 minute break and I'll get up and stretch and we'll, and we'll come back and do this. Um, but I haven't been hitting the lavender. I'm just physically kind of tired because I had a very physical day today. One of my trees wasn't doing so well. I was picking up branches and just doing all sorts of other stuff. So I don't know. Uh, Shlomo, this, this would allow you to be a dog wizard. So as a bard, here's an option. You can take your charisma score increases by one to a maximum of 20. Also, in addition to other bonuses provided by your college, a creature who uses your Bardic Inspiration die to make a successful roll may, as a bonus action, pass the Bardic Inspiration die to a creature within 30 feet. The recipient may then use this die roll for their next roll. Hmm... So aside from the charisma bump, pardon me. Sorry for the sorry for the yawns. Aside from the charisma bump, I don't understand. Like the bard would just give the would just give the inspiration, right? Or I guess that's a way to maybe like double up inspiration on a turn or something. Once again, I see the same problem, says first cast. The player is going to have to constantly remind the other people to use it. 
I I get what you're saying, first cast. I I very much do. Man, my half elf bard isn't as good as a dog. Feels bad, man. <laughs> That's right, me smart but can't read. Uh, first cast, no. It's saying the person who receives the inspiration, yeah. But but then why wouldn't the bard just give it to the other person to begin with? Or, or I I guess I'm I'm failing to see the strategy, maybe. Uh, you're calming and charming. You may cast Calm Emotions or Charm Person once per short rest, both as second level spells. Oh, I get it. So if if the Bardic Inspiration they received helps them achieve a victory in something, then they can pass the inspiration on to someone else. Got it. Okay. Got it, got it, got it. Howling Melody, you may cast the spell Dissonant Whispers once per short rest without spending a spell slot and may cast this spell at any level you can cast normally. Hmm... Uh, then the cleric. The good mother canine deity presents a new domain for canine clerics. The companion domain presented below. Canine clerics who choose to follow a different deity should use the existing available rules for cleric characters. Alright, so they're not going to get uh, doggo feats. But our canine clerics will get the companion domain, and I guess we'll explore that below. You think Howling Melody is too strong? I, I do kind of feel that as well, first cast. Yes, uh, quite the good boy, Shlomo. All right, I'm going to I'm going to take a 10 minute break. I'm going to get a snack. Uh I've been drinking some cold water. Um maybe I'll find something with a little caffeine and we will continue uh to get through the supplement here. Looks like we're we're halfway finished with it. Yep, there's the companion domain. Oh, well the last couple pages all this is licensure anyway. Uh so we'll at least get through this in part 2. Uh, we can talk about, uh, uh, we can talk a little bit about it. If I'm re-energized, maybe we can even try making a character. And, uh, and we'll go from there. So hang tight, and I will, uh, I'll be back shortly, everyone.